and we'll begin there in a moment. If we could just, uh, let's see, we got, uh, just, did you already mention, uh, Stephen already mentioned, no Lord's Supper Sunday? Did he mention that already? Oh, I'll mention it now. Uh, we're not going to have Lord's Supper this Sunday. It'll be the following Sunday. So next Sunday we'll be having the Lord's Supper. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, tonight we're grateful and thankful once again to have this time and this opportunity to gather together with the people of God around the Word of God and to the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight I pray, Lord, that as we go to your word, you would challenge our hearts that we might continue to grow in grace and continue to understand your plan and purpose for human history and your purpose for the church, your purpose for Israel as you glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift up in prayer tonight our brethren going through some physical trials. We lift up Jan Hopper. We thank you that she's doing better, and we do pray, Father, that you would continue to mend and heal that foot and ankle and just restore strength and health to her completely, encourage her spirit and fill at this time. We pray for Ernie Lafert, Lord, that you'd heal him and touch him and strengthen his body and encourage his faith. We pray for our brother Bruce Allen, that you'd strengthen him and Pray you comfort and encourage his heart. We do lift up Elizabeth Daycake and baby Isaiah and the young man Isaiah, Lord. You know the needs that each person has, Lord. Uh, just pray, Father, that you would meet them at their point of need, Lord, and most of all that you'd use the circumstances to make Jesus Christ more real to their hearts. And I do pray tonight that I could Speak your word with wisdom, with grace, with conviction, passion, with humility, with the authority that your word deserves. And take the knowledge you've given me on this subject, make it clear, make it accurate, make it understandable that your people may be blessed. And if any unsaved folks hear the message tonight or in the future, we do pray you would convict them of their sin, of their need of Christ, that they might believe on him and receive eternal life through faith in Jesus' name. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, we're going to continue in our study looking at the future of the nation Israel. And we've been looking at how the church has not replaced Israel the church tonight, we're going to look in particular how the church is not Israel in the scriptures. We're going to continue in that theme tonight. If we could put our first uh, slide up on the board, Mike. All right. I don't have my long-range reading glasses on me, but I think I can make my way through it. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament taught that the nation Israel are uh, the enemies of the gospel today because they're in unbelief and they rejected Christ as their Messiah. But in a future day, there will be a remnant saved out of national Israel because God's promises are irrevocable. The Lord promised to Abraham a land and a people forever that would descend from him. Uh, in the new covenant, Israel is going to be restored and forgiven. We've studied that. In the Davidic covenant, where there would be a king that would descend from David's line uh, for Israel forever. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that, the son of David, the king of Israel, the head of the church. And all the covenants and promises in the Bible that speak of a regathered and restored Israel when Jesus Christ returns will be literally fulfilled because the Lord keeps his promises. But there was a condition in all these things that the Lord set forth, and it was this. If Israel turned away from him and uh, rejected, then he would cast them aside, not forever. Remember Jeremiah? As long as the cycles of nature are going, sun coming them up, right? And the moon, the moon at night and stars... That's when they stop, when the sun stops getting up in the morning, the moon, the stars at night, then that's when he'll cast away Israel forever, and that's not going to happen. 
but there would be a period of time where Israel would be set apart and that's the age we're living in today and he's calling out the church from Jew and Gentile alike who believe in Jesus Christ and they now become not a part of Israel but something new the one new man called the church which is his body the body of Christ which was the mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament but now has been revealed to us through the writings of the Apostle Paul okay so it, because of their unbelief today they're under God's judgment but there is a future generation that will receive Christ when they look upon him whom they have pierced and they will be restored our next slide God's covenants with Israel illustrate that God has a plan for the nation Israel in the future God keeps his promises God is all veracity he cannot lie he will fulfill all his promises and the promises were made specifically to Israel the descendants of Abraham not to the church the next slide the Bible considers anyone who possesses the genes of Abraham Isaac and Jacob to be racially an Israelite one does not have to be full-blooded Israelite to be racially part of Israel it is a myth that an Israelite is someone with absolute racial purity and we noted this how Joseph's sons Manasseh and Ephraim were a part of the 12 tribes of Israel they each were half a tribe making up the 12th and they were given full privilege as Jews and yet they were half Jew and half Gentile they had a Gentile mother an Egyptian mother uh, Moses' sons were required to be circumcised Moses married a Midianite woman who was not a Jew okay as his sons were were half Jew and half Gentile yet they were considered part of Israel uh, we saw how that when uh, Gentiles sojourned among the people of the land of Israel uh, that if they were willing to be circumcised as male and keep the feasts and follow the covenant that they would also be included among the people of Israel so to say that a person has to be 100 percent Jewish blood there's never been anybody 100 percent Jewish blood okay Abraham himself the father of the nation Israel was indeed from Ur of the Chaldees he was a Gentile okay an aristocrat Gentile all right so that's uh, when people try to say yeah you know God's done with Israel because there's no real pure racially Jewish people that's just a myth okay it's not biblical also any Gentiles that were proselytes we've already mentioned to Judaism they was a part of Israel and we saw that in Exodus 12 48 49 our next slide okay and interestingly and I, and I just doing a little study this week and I thought I'd include this note just to uh, illustrate a point uh, the Bible teaches that there is a future day where the nation Israel will be regathered from around the nations brought back to the land of Israel and restored with Jesus Christ as King David as the vice regent or like the you know the right hand man of the Lord during the kingdom the 12 apostles ruling each one over one of the 12 tribes Matthew 19 28 that Jesus Christ will rule over the earth for a thousand years and then on into eternity his kingdom and uh, it teaches that Israel will be restored when Christ returns and regathered and they'll be exalted as the lead nation with Christ ruling from Jerusalem with a rebuilt third temple uh, at that time okay well actually it'll be a fourth temple okay third one's coming up soon in that land okay but now the point being is this is all taught in scripture Israel today that is in the land that's not God's doing okay they're still there in unbelief that's not restored Israel and, and those that teach it or believe it they just not understanding the, the the covenants and the plan of God Israel will not be restored and truly regathered until Christ returns and they actually believe in him okay and see him face to face one-third of the survivors in that time which is yet future okay after the battle of Armageddon 
to note this, and this is an interesting point. There's a Jewish sect today, okay? And there's, you know, just, you know, in Judaism, it's just like Christianity. You know, you have Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostals, right? And, uh, you know, Bible churches like us. And you go on Lutheran and Catholic, and you can keep going on down the line, right? All different kinds, uh, Nazarenes, etc., etc. Et well, the same in Judaism. There's different sects, okay? Different groups that have, uh, you know, various differences in their beliefs, okay? But among uh, what are considered the ultra-Orthodox Jews, which would kind of be akin to like what the Pharisees were back in Jesus' day, among the ultra-Orthodox Jews, there's a group called the Haridim, okay? Either Haridim or Harudim, however they want to pronounce it. It's, and this group is mostly anti-Zionist, and of course Zionism is simply... Uh, those folks who support that the Jews should have their homeland now. Okay, and Zion was the fortress of David where he had his palace and it also was kind of like the Pentagon of Israel back during the kingdom when David was ruling and reigning. Okay, and of course a Zionist is someone who supports that Israel should be in the land today and has a right to be in the land today. And uh, an anti-Zionist, well, obviously would be people like Hamas, Hezbollah, right? Etc. Uh, also, you know, Christians who say that, you know, Israel has been replaced and has no future. God's done with them forever. They've been replaced by the church. That would be anti-Zionism. Uh, I would say, in a sense, I'm pro-Israel. I don't know if I'm pro-Zionist, but really, what does it matter either way, all right? The point is God still is going to do what God's going to do, okay? But it's interesting that this group, the Haridim or Harudim, okay, is mostly anti-Zionist, but not anti-Israel. Now, that's interesting because these are the most strictest of Jews, okay? And yet they're anti-Zionist. They're not but they're not anti-Israel. They support their Jewish brothers, but they do not believe that this is God's will, what's going on in Israel right now today. Okay, now let's look at why. If we could keep reading. From the study of the Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the Talmud, which is the commentary of the rabbis on, on the... Uh, they call the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets, the Old Testament. Uh, they believe that the nation Israel today is simply the result of the Jewish nationalism of men. They believe that Israel will only be restored and truly regathered when the Messiah, remember they reject Jesus, so they're still looking for the Messiah of Israel, the promised one to come and deliver them and regather the nation, restore the nation, and exalt the nation to glory over the earth, okay? In the Jewish mind of the ultra-Orthodox, they've rejected Christ, so he's out of the picture as Messiah, but he is the Messiah. Hello? All right. He is the Messiah, but they reject him. But they do know that the Old Testament teaches that there's two aspects of Messiah in the Old Testament. One is the suffering servant, Isaiah 53, right? The one who comes to suffer for the sins of the people, right? Pay the sin debt. That's Christ at the first advent. And then there's an, another aspect of Messiah, Messiah painted, another picture. And the second picture of Messiah is that of who? The Lord Jesus Christ as the Lion of Judah, right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, returning in glory, destroying his enemies, and regathering, restoring, and exalting the nation Israel over the earth with him ruling from Jerusalem. Well, in the Jewish mind, rejecting Christ's first advent, the suffering servant, dying for the sins of the people, they focused in and locked in on Messiah, second advent, right? When he comes to regather and restore Israel and exalt them as a nation. So in their mind, they're still looking for Messiah. And when he comes, it's going to be glorious not understanding that what they're reading in the Old Testament is 
a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second advent, his second coming, when he returns to judge the nations and to regather Israel, bring them back to the land, restore them, exalt them as the head nation over the earth, and he himself will rule from Jerusalem with King David as his vice regent and the 12 apostles ruling over the 12 tribes and all those Christians who have been faithful being rewarded with rulership privileges over what? All the various geographical areas of nations around the world. Hopefully you and I will be participating in that uh, with positions of rulership if we're faithful. Okay, now think of this. They believe that Israel will only be restored and regathered when the Messiah comes to fulfill uh, and promises of the kingdom and the land to Israel. So to them, Israel's restoration is God's work alone. In other words, God doesn't need man's politics, Jewish nationalism, military might in wars to accomplish it. They believe, the, uh, uh, the Herodim, and, and also there's a subgroup I should mention, there's a subgroup of the Herodim or the Herodim, however you want to say it. It's called the Hasidim, okay? You know the Hasids, you always see them with the little what? Curls and the funny hats and the long black coats. You've probably seen them around, okay? And uh, the Hasidim uh, are also like a subgroup of the Herodim, all right? And these are the ultra Orthodox. And uh, they believe that it is forbidden by God for the Jewish people to reconstitute the Jewish rule of the land of Israel before Messiah comes. So that's why they're anti-Zionist. They're the strictest of Jews and they say Israel cannot be restored and regather and take the land, okay, that is rightfully theirs until Messiah comes. If Messiah isn't here, we shouldn't be worried about what's going on over there in Israel. They support, most of them, there are actually, believe it or not, some Harudim Hasid groups that actually are also anti-Israel and actually protest against Israel because they, they're sinning, because they're trying to do what only the Messiah can do. To them, only the Messiah can come and regather and restore the nation Israel and bring them back into the land and exalt them, okay? And anybody else who tries it is trying to take the place of the Messiah. They're trying to do God's work for him and they consider that sin, okay? So to them, they are even anti-Israel and anti-Zionists where some of the Haredim, uh, the Hasids are anti-Zionist but still support their Jewish brethren in Israel okay but they think that we're not going to get involved we're not going to be involved with what's going on there we're going to live our lives where we are at. we're not going to run back to Israel because that's not of God you starting to get the picture okay and then there are, of course there's all kinds of Jews in between who believe oh yeah that's good this is God's will we should be back there but to the strict Orthodox Jew that studies the Old Testament, the Talmud, the Torah, they believe that Israel should not be back in the land until Messiah comes, okay, who they're expecting, all right? So that's an interesting point because Israel will not be truly regathered and restored until who comes? Their Messiah his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And he will fulfill all these covenants and all these promises made through the prophets in the Old Testament. But only he can do it. So what's, what's going on there today is uh, basically Jewish nationalism and the work of uh, men. It's really not the work of God, okay? So that's important to grasp and to understand. So I want you to, so I just thought I'd mention that because I think that's very interesting that the strictest of Jews, when they read the Old Testament, they understand clearly that Israel will be regathered and restored 
but only when Messiah comes. That's what we're teaching here, right? That the church has not replaced Israel. God's still got a plan for Israel. Today they're in unbelief, okay? And they're set apart. God's using the church, calling out the church, but because of his promises made to the fathers, which are irrevocable, the, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. It doesn't change his mind. That there is a future generation that will be regathered and restored. Okay, so let's move on over, if you will. And we're in the book of Acts, and we're in chapter 1. And we want to continue looking at this theme tonight that re refutes what's known as replacement theology, which is the system of theology which is heretical but adopted by many Christian groups today in their eschatology that says that the church has replaced Israel and God has no more plan for Israel. That's replacement theology, okay? But uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1. I want to look at verses 6 and 7 quickly. We've already mentioned this before, but let's look again. They're on the, this is after the resurrection, and they're on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is there with the disciples, the apostles, and, he's, and they say to him, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay, so it's, it, that's an important question. The apostles, who spent three and a half years with Jesus, believed that Israel, not the church, okay, the church at this point has not been formed and hasn't been revealed, right? The mystery. These are Jews who are with their Messiah, their risen Lord, and they say, is this, are you going to do it now? Are you going to restore, are you going to fulfill all these covenants and all these promises made to the patriarchs and through the prophets in the Old Testament and give Israel their physical, earthly kingdom right now and their kingdom glory? Are you going to do it, Lord? Is it going to happen now? So one thing is very certain. Notice something. When the kingdom that's spoken of here is restored, it's restored to who? Israel, right? Now, notice the Lord's answer. It's not restored to the church. That was never a promise of the church to have a piece of land, right, and be, and be uh, ruling over the nations. The church rules over the nations as the emissaries of Christ, not as the people of what? The covenant of Israel. Look at verse 7. And he said unto them, now this is Jesus, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Now, Jesus didn't say, you guys are crazy. Don't you know that my Father's all done with Israel? We're going to do something new called the church, and they're going to take Israel's place? He didn't say that. What he did say is, it's not the time right now. Right now, you got something important to do. You have to go. They're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and they're going to be witnesses. And then they're going to go out and preach the gospel, and people are going to believe on him and be saved. Then he's going to reveal the mystery of the church, the body of Christ, to the apostle Paul. All right? And then they're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel to Jew and Gentile alike. All right? That salvation has already been paid for, and it's a free gift through faith alone in Christ alone. Okay. So there's a lot of work to do. The church has to be formed. Okay? The mystery has to be revealed. But he doesn't tell them, it's not going to happen. He doesn't say, no, nah, there's no kingdom. He says what? It's not for you to know the times and the season which the Father had put in his own power. In other words, he basically says, well, we're not going to be concerned about that right now. There's other work that's got to be done. It's, it's not for you to know right now when that's going to happen. But he doesn't deny that it has to and is going to happen. Do you see? It's very clear. He just says, it's not for you to understand and know all that right now. Okay? He'd reveal a lot of that later to them. Okay? Now, that's important. Go with me to, and, and of course, when they were speaking to him, they said, you're going to restore the kingdom. In their mind, they remember the Davidic covenant, right? They saw the crowds when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, right? On Palm Sunday, 
and they were singing Hosanna to the son of David, right? And uh, they, were, they were hailing him as their king, right? And of course, as the son of David, which meant they, un they were understanding that this Jesus is the Messiah, and he is going to fulfill the Davidic covenant that there will be a king that will descend from David's lineage for Israel and a kingdom for Israel with that king ruling over it forever whom the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills that covenant and with that kingdom is a physical earthly kingdom and we'll be looking at a lot of this in the studies that are coming up this is a pretty lengthy study and we're going to be thorough with it as you know and but we're not going to go into overkill go with me to verse 15 in the book of acts okay actually verse 14 all right and this is the first this is the first church council if you will if you want to call it that it was a gathering of all the apostles and the elders from jerusalem and uh the question was do the gentiles have to obey the law okay and the the thought if you look at verse one you just flip back uh, skip back to verse one of the chapter quickly it says and certain men which came down from judea they were jews taught the brethren this is at antioch the gentiles and said except ye be circumcised after the manner of moses ye cannot be saved okay so they were still under what legalism they had believed in christ but what they were teaching was you still had to keep the law and if you're a male, you got to be circumcised, okay? Which was part of the old covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all what? The descendants of them, all the Jews. And then there was a big argument, big debate. Paul and Barnabas and these guys got at it. And then they decided, well, let's go up to Jerusalem and let's everybody get together. And we'll have a big meeting of all the leaders, right? The apostles and the elders, right? And we'll come to a final decision and conclusion and of course the final decision and conclusion that they came to is uh, verse 11 uh, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they in other words we'll be saved by grace not by any works of the law circumcision or anything like that so then James gets up and after everybody declares what God has been doing through the Apostle Paul and Barnabas with the Gentiles and how the Gentiles are getting saved and healed and it's just through simple faith in Christ not by all these religious rituals and works then James stands up and look what he says Simeon and of course that's a reference that's the, that's the Greek form of Simon or Simeon had or the Jewish form actually had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, Peter declares that the Lord is visiting the Gentiles to take a people out for his member, main name. Remember Peter went to Cornelius' house, the Gentile? And uh, he, at first, Peter didn't want to go. Peter says, no, I don't, I've never been to a Gentile's house because the, uh, part of the rabbinic teaching okay was that you can't uh, you can't you defiled if you go into a Gentile's house okay if a Gentile was walking down the same side of the street you went and you walked on the other side okay uh, but the Lord was showing Peter no my grace is for everybody not just for Jews who are under the law but for everyone because it's now my grace is going to be revealed in its fullness because of Christ's work on the cross and the Gentiles are going to get in on this and in fact he was preparing Peter to realize that there was going to be something new he was going to do called the church, which is the body of Christ, which was a mystery hidden previously, but now was being revealed. And then Paul would get saved. And of course, through Paul, he would send this gospel of grace to the Gentiles. And the, Paul would reveal the mystery about the body of Christ and the church made of believing Jew and believing Gentile and that Israel was set aside until what? A future day. And so what he's claiming here, James is saying, right now God's work is to bring a people out of the Gentiles. Okay? And that's the church, the body of Christ. Look at verse 15. 
And he continues, and to this agree the words of the prophets. So now James goes back to the prophets. Now the prophets didn't know about the church. Okay, we'll look at this further down the road in the study. But the prophets did know, it was revealed to the prophets that the Gentiles would be saved too. Okay? What was not revealed to the prophets was the body of Christ, that God would take Israel, put them aside until a future day, and then take every Jew that believes today and every Gentile that believes today and make something new called the church, the body of Christ. Okay? And that when he was finished with that, then he would return to the nation Israel. Okay? So, but the prophets understood that the Gentiles would be saved, but they didn't understand the mystery of the body of Christ. That came through Paul. Then you look at verse 16. After this, I will return. Okay, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So it's written in the prophets that, you now building again the tabernacle of David, that's a reference to uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 7 to 17, which we'll study in the future. It's called the Davidic Covenant, or the Davidic Covenant, whatever way you prefer to say it. Some people say potato, some say potato. I say tomato, you say tomato, but it's the Davidic Covenant, or the Davidic Covenant, okay? However you want to say it. And 2 Samuel 7, uh, 7 to 17 teaches that there's a king that will come f uh, from David, from his line, and a kingdom forever for the nation Israel. Well, that's what he's referring to when he says he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, meaning that he is going to, the Lord is going to return, and when he returns, he's going to restore what? The tabernacle of David, or in other words, the kingdom to Israel, just like we've been saying, of course, and as the uh, Herodim understand, okay? When Messiah comes, that's when the tabernacle of David, or the kingdom is restored, the Davidic kingdom, the land, the king, the regathering, the exaltation of Israel, okay, and fulfilling all the Old Testament, right? And so then he will build it again. Then you look at verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. And of course, verse 18, God has a plan, which he, we have been privileged that he's revealed it to us in this book, right? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. How lost we would be in this world with all the chaos that's going around us if God has not revealed his plan to us in this book. He's told us, okay, his plans and purposes. He's revealed to, them, to us if we care enough to actually seek him and study them and learn them, you see, and be humble and teachable and objective. We know that we're in the age of the church now. God's calling a people out of the Gentiles. The church today is predominantly Gentile. There are some Jews, small percentage, that actually believe and become part of the church, the body of Christ. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who were, were Jewish and they become Christian and they want to call themselves Messianic Jews. And rather than participating in their full privileges as Christians, they still want to identify with their Judaism and they put themselves back under the law like the guys that were mentioned here in uh, Acts 15 who got saved. They were for the Jews from Judea and they were trying to tell everybody else it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You've got you to get what? Circumcised if you're a man and follow what? The, the law of Moses, okay? And they wanted the legalism. And there's unfortunately these Messianic Jews today who they believe in Christ as the Savior, but then they go put themselves back under what? The law, and the whole book of Galatians tells them, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has set you free and be not again entangled with the yoke of bondage, which is the law, because nobody can keep it. Okay. So now, in, important, we see that God has a future plan for the nation Israel. And the apostles understood it very clearly. Lord, you're going to restore the kingdom now, the Davidic kingdom? Not now. It's not for you to know right now. You know it's not for you to know the exact schedule of these things chronologically, the times and seasons. But he would reveal to them, them to them in the future. 
Okay? He didn't say, no, Israel's done. He said, I'm not going to show you now. It's going to happen, but not what? Now. All right? Um, let's uh, go, if you will, with me. I want you to go to the book of Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 22. Okay? Um, Peter preaching. Day of Pentecost, right? Give me a second here. Peter pre in fact, uh, before we read this verse, let me give you another verse that just came to my mind. It's a good one. Go me to Luke chapter 9. Keep a thumb or a pen in Acts chapter 2. We'll come right back there. Go me to Luke chapter 19, okay? And this is an important passage. Look at uh, verse number 11. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added, this is Jesus, and spake a parable because he was nigh or near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Okay? Now, you know, in the Jewish mind, what's the kingdom of God? It's Messiah's kingdom. It's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, right? A king and a kingdom for Israel over the earth with Israel regathered, restored, and exalted, right? Over the nations with Messiah ruling from Jerusalem, right? And notice what it says. They were near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Their thinking at this time was, well, hell, the Messiah is here. What's the next thing that has to happen? The kingdom. Because you've got to remember the Jewish mindset, which I already explained to you at the beginning. In their thinking, when Messiah comes, what's the next thing that happened? He sets up the kingdom. Remember, they only looked at the second aspect of Messiah. They, they were blinded to the fact that the Messiah had to suffer for the sins of the people first. That's Christ at his first coming. His incarnation, his first advent. The Jewish mind looked almost all at all, uh, they did look at it, at the point of the second advent. You see, that's what they focused on because that's what they wanted. Uh, they wanted to be delivered from the Roman. Uh, dominion over them, the Gentile dominion that was over the nation, okay? They wanted to be free from it. They wanted to see their nation, Israel, enjoy the glory that it had during the time of King David and King Solomon, right? They wanted all that prosperity and glory restored and power over the nations. And so they knew when Messiah came, he would do this, but that's Messiah's second coming. That's Jesus at his second coming. Before that, he must come and suffer and die for the sins of the people. His first coming. See? And uh, right now, they're thinking, well, he's here, so what's going to happen next? The kingdom, right? They thought it should be immediately set up. Even they... Even the apostles, and they were pretty far in right now. This is probably into the, well into his uh, last year before his crucifixion. They've been walking with him for a few years now, heard his teaching, saw the miracles. They believed in him as the Savior. They were saved, and yet they still did not understand the cross. They had believed in him as their Savior, but they did not understand the cross. Okay? If you recall, uh, a little later on, as they're on the way to Jerusalem, he tells them, look, I'm going to go up there, and, you know, the Gentiles are going to take me, the Romans, and they're going to arrest me, and they're going to basically kill me, crucify me. And what does Peter say? No, 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 not you, Lord. Never let it happen. And what does he say to him? Get behind me, Peter. Right? You, say, you, you cherish the things of Satan more than the things of God. You, don't you understand that I have to die? 
for the sins of the people. So even up until that late point, like right up to the point where he was going to be arrested and crucified, they did not have the understanding of what the scriptures taught that Messiah at the first coming must suffer, the suffering servant suffering for the sins of the people. They only had the concept of when Messiah comes, Israel is exalted over the no longer be under the dominant Gentiles, will be the dominant ones. But their fleshly mind wanted, right? They wanted to see that physical, material glory manifested where Israel now has all the power and we don't have to be under the dominion of who? The Gentile Romans and their legions. You see? So they thought the kingdom would come what immediately. You see it? Now look. And then he tells them a parable. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Ah, who's the certain nobleman? Jesus. What's the far country when he ascends back to what? Heaven. He's basically telling them in a parable which they don't fully grasp that he's going to be going away for a long time to a far country. Okay? He's going back to the Father. He's going to send back to the Father, right? He said to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. So he's going to return to receive the kingdom. But the kingdom doesn't come until his what? Return. Right? And he called his ten servants and he delivered to them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Okay, what does he do? He, he gives ten pounds to the servants, right? And he says, now go out and be busy and produce something. And if, we're not going to take the time to read the whole parable because we've read it many times when we went over who was, but read it when you get a chance. And when he comes back, he calls the servants. When he comes back, okay, look at verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom... Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So in other words, the picture is this. Jesus has ascended back to heaven. That's the far country. He's going to return. When he returns, he will receive the kingdom. For who? Israel, the fulfillment of the Davidic kingdom. Him as the Messiah, son of David, fulfilling it all. The kingdom will be set up. And then he's going to call his servants the church, and what's, the, what's, the, what's the, uh, the, the 10 pounds represent? Every one of us gets some gift or gifts from the Lord. Every one of us has time, talent, treasure, resources. And we're going to be judged for our reward, not our salvation. That was taken care of at the cross, and that's free. But we're going to be judged as to what is our position and our rank in the kingdom that he's going to set up when he returns to exalt Israel and regather them, right? He's going to rescue the church at the rapture, at the end of the 70th week, and then he's going to call his servants in, you and I, and all believers down through the ages, and he's going to say, now let's evaluate the life you lived after you got saved. And the only way that life in that day is going to be rewarded and have any value is if you're living for him today. And if you're faithful to live for him the best you can till the end. And we've studied this in great detail. But what's the point we want to take out of this? There's still a kingdom for Jesus to receive when he returns. This is what the apostles were thinking in Acts chapter 1. This is what James is talking about in Acts chapter 15 when the tabernacle of David is going to be rebuilt. Okay, go back to Acts chapter 2 now. We've got about 10 minutes, and we'll tie it all together for tonight. What we want to note is all this concerns Israel. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 2. I want to do some comparison. comparisons. Peter preaching at Pentecost to the Jewish people. Okay? Not the Gentiles, but the Jews. Notice what he says in verse number 22. Ye men of Israel. Pretty clear. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, 
as ye yourselves also know. And then he goes on to preach how Christ was crucified by them. But notice what he says. Whom's he addressing? He's addressing the men of Israel, okay? The unbelieving Jews, ye men of Israel. Look at verse number 36 of the same chapter. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now notice something. Unbelieving Israel that rejected Christ as their Messiah is still called what? Israel. The church is never. The thing we want to realize is the church is the church. Israel is Israel. They're two distinct groups in God's plan. The church is never called Israel. Never. The church does not replace Israel. Notice what he says to the unbelieving Jews of the nation Israel. He says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. He calls the unbelieving Jews of Israel, Israel. The church is not Israel. They're two different groups. Go down to verse 47. But notice this. Now, people believed on the Lord Jesus. They believed the gospel message that Peter and the apostles preached. And then it says, uh, let's read verse 46 and verse 47. And these people who had believed, they became Christians. They were born again. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now you've got to remember, these folks had not received the revelation of the body of Christ, the mystery, the church yet. They were Jews that believed in Christ as their Messiah. Okay? Th 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 Paul didn't come along to reveal the mystery, but they also understood there was something different about them and the unbelieving Jews, you see? And look what it says in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So they understood that there was a distinction between Israel that didn't believe and the Jews like themselves who had now believed and were a church, an assembly. You see? But one thing we've got to understand, and of course it's going to be revealed later in the book of Acts through the Apostle Paul that the church, okay, and of course in his epistles, the church is the mystery that's now made known, which is called the body of Christ, made of Jews and Gentiles alike. Okay? It's something totally new. But what we want to note is there's a distinction between the unbelieving Jew and anyone who believes in Christ. In this case, it happened to be Jews. Later on, it would be predominantly Gentiles. They're, they're distinct. Israel's distinct from those who have believed in Christ in this age. Two distinct groups, okay? The church is not Israel. Go with me, and of course, we can uh, read a few more verses. Uh, go to Acts chapter 28, verse number 17. Acts chapter 28, verse number 17. Just give me a second, we'll tie this together. Now this is Paul when he's a prisoner at Rome, okay? And it says in verse... Uh, Number 17, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. He called all the leadership of the Jews that were living in Rome together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Okay? He explains to them why he's in prison because uh, he's there because the Jews got angry at him and had him arrested because he was preaching Christ and they were under conviction who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause 
of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation. Now notice something. Paul is distinguishing himself from the Jews, from Israel. Because even though he is a Jew and a former Pharisee, he's now part of what? The church, the body of Christ. We'll see that in a minute. Keep going, if you will, to verse 20. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound by this chain. And, of course, the hope of Israel, he's referring to the resurrection, okay, in the, of the Messiah that was predicted in the prophets. Now look at Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Just move ahead. And when they had appointed him a day, so they decided, okay, well, you're trying to talk to us about the Messiah, the hope of Israel, the resurrection. All right, we'll pick a day and we'll come and visit you and we'll discuss these things and you can preach to us and uh, give us your, your take on it all. In verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, okay, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. So now, notice something. He's speaking to who? The Jews about the hope of what? Israel. But notice, he doesn't include himself among the Jews because he's a believer in Christ and he's now part of what? The church. Let's finish in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and this will all become clear. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Let me get there, and we'll close right here. All right, almost there. All right, Ephesians chapter 1 now. And I want you to look at verse number 22. Now, oh, in, in fact, one more, one more verse. Go to Acts chapter, hold uh, Ephesians 1. Give you one more verse that'll help. Acts chapter 20, verse number 17. Now, did you notice something? When, when Paul is speaking here in Acts 28, he's talking to who? the chief leaders of the Jews, the elders of Israel, those who are gathered concerning the hope of Israel, right? He's separating himself and the, every believer in Jesus Christ from this group of people that is unbelieving Israel, all right? He doesn't call them the church. He doesn't call the church Israel. But look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Previous to that, on his way to Rome, he stopped at Miletus, and notice what he says. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of what? The church. See, he calls, he, in Acts 28, 17, he calls, calls what? The chief leaders or the elders of what? Israel. That's one group, right? Here in Acts chapter 20, he's speaking, they were unbelievers. That was Israel, the Jews, right? Acts chapter 28, 17, right? The 23. Here, he's speaking to another group of elders. But these are what? The leaders of what? The church. These are believers. They're another distinct group. So you have the elders of Israel, the elders of the church. Two distinct groups that he's speaking to. One is unbelieving Jews. The other is what? Believing Gentiles and believing Jews. That is now the church, okay? All right, now go with me to Ephesians 1 and we'll close. Look at verse 22 to 23. Now this is something we'll look at in detail next time. Jesus in the Bible is the king of Israel. He's their king. In fact, they even, by mistake, thinking they were mocking him, the Romans put it on the cross, right? This is the king of the Jews, right? He is their king. He fulfills the, the Davidic what? Monarchy, 
the Davidic covenant, a king and a kingdom that descends from David for Israel forever. He's a king for Israel. But he's not a king to the church. To the church, he's the head of the body. Right? He's never called the king of the church. He's the king of kings. He's the king above every king. When it comes to authority, he's the final authority over every earthly what? King, right? An earthly politician and leader or monarch. He's the king of the Jews and fulfillment of the Davidic. He's never called the king of the church because we're his brethren. We're spiritual royalty with him. You see? We are spiritual royalty with him. The Bible says we're a royal priesthood. And we're, he's the firstborn from the dead among many what? Brethren. Okay? And we're called to, our calling and election will be to share his throne. He that overcometh and keep my works to the end shall rule the nations with me. With a rod of iron. He that overcometh shall sit on my throne with me. In other words, share my authority and rule the nations. The one that's faithful. Not just saved, but saved and a faithful disciple. And, and notice what it says in verse 22 and 23. Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. He says, verses 21, 22, 23, that, that Christ... In fact, let's read verse 20. It says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, Christ gaining the victory over Satan in the conflict of the ages, is now given the title the Lord Jesus Christ, right, as the victor. Far above all principality and power, above every what? Authority, right? All the fallen angels and all the holy angels. Because they all have rank. Satan's in his demon army. Remember the study of Ephesians 6 and the conflict of the Asians? Satan has a table of organization. Ranks in his army of demons and fallen angels. Same for the holy angels, the elect angels. In dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, Christ is exalted above every authority to the highest position because he won the victory through his death, burial, and resurrection over Satan in the conflict of the ages. And he defeated Satan, sin, and death. And then verse 22, and had put all things under his feet. To be under his feet means under his dominion, authority, power. And gave him to be the what? The head over all things to the what? Church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Notice, he's the king of the Jews, but he's the head of the church, which is his what? Body. And we are what? Members of Christ, bone of his bones, flesh of his what? Flesh. We have two distinct groups. The church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. The church is never called Israel. Okay, and you've got to keep these two separate and distinct. And when you do that, then you can begin to understand God's program for Israel and God's program for the church. All right? And we'll look at this more in our next study. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're grateful and thankful tonight to have this time to note, to study these things from your word. I do pray that you would challenge our hearts, that we would continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I take this moment right now to anyone listening tonight or in the future, if you're not saved, Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He paid your sin debt in full tonight. He offers you an opportunity for eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and a right standing with the God of the universe if you will simply believe upon him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, he promised. Verily, verily, he that believeth on me hath 
present possession, everlasting life. Believe that he is the Christ, the Savior of the world who gives eternal life. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken in anyone's heart tonight or in the future, and they have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you have forgiven them, saved them. Pray that you reveal your love to them in a special way and lead them back to study your word. They might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And as we depart tonight, pray that you take the written word, make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. We ask these things in his name. Amen and amen. Folks, been a pleasure. Have a great night. Mike, nothing going on tomorrow, right? All right. I'll see you Sunday morning. God bless.